Poems to a Listener, Readings and Conversation with Contemporary Poets. It wakes when I wake, walks when I walk, turns back when I turn back, beating me to the door. It spoils my food and steals my sleep and mocks me, saying, where is your God now? And so, like a widow, I lie down after supper. If I lie down or sit up, it's all the same. The days and nights bear me along. To strangers, I must seem alive. Spring comes, summer, cool, clear weather, heat, rain. Welcome. I'm Henry Lyman, and that was poet Jane Kenyon, reading from The Boat of Quiet Hours, published by Grey Wolf Press. In the poem, she seems to be haunted by depression, as she told me, and by something that seems to ridicule every move she makes, every belief she holds. It's my shadow. It wants to do everything with me. It's just one step behind me. It wants everything I want. Yeah, you know, it, it imitates you. Mm. It mocks you in that sense. Mm. A shadow. A shadow. Yeah. And the shadow addressing you asks, where is your God now? Mm -hmm. Well, in the deeps of depression, one feels uh, abandoned by everyone, uh, even by God. And this, uh, where is your God now, comes from the Psalms, actually. This is, this is a, an outcry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use this scream of pain from the Psalms in this poem. Where is your God now? Mm -hmm. The Bat. I was reading about rationalism, the kind of thing we do up north in early winter, where the sun leaves work for the day at 4.15. Maybe the world is intelligible to the rational mind, and maybe we light the lamps at dusk for nothing. Then I heard wings overhead. The cats and I chased the bat in circles. Living room, kitchen, pantry, kitchen, living room. At every turn it evaded us, like the identity of the third person in the Trinity, the one who spoke through the prophets, the one who astounded Mary by suddenly coming near. What is it about the bat that reminds you of the uh, third person of the Trinity? Well, the sudden breaking in to, to one's reality. I, I think of Gabriel's appearance to Mary, this unlooked for, unimagined entry mm. into one's life of something very rich and mysterious. Such as the Holy Spirit or yes. the Holy Ghost. Yes, or the Holy Ghost. Gabriel. Gabriel. In the Annunciation. Mm. Um, the bat seems to remind you that um, the world is not intelligible to the rational mind. It comes just at that moment when you are reading about rationalism, almost like an answer. Well, this is to say there are imponderables. There are unlooked-for occurrences, unimagined. That anything might happen? Mm -hmm. At the winter solstice, the pines look black in the half-light of dawn. Stillness. While we slept, an inch of new snow simplified the field. Today, of all days, the sun will shine no more than is strictly necessary. At the village church last night, the boys, shepherds and wise men, pressed close to the manger in obedience, wishing only for time to pass. But the girl dressed as Mary trembled as she leaned over the pungent hay, and like the mother of Christ, wondered why she had been chosen. After the pageant, 
a ruckus of cards, presents, and homemade Christmas sweets. A few of us stayed to clear the bright scraps and ribbons from the pews and lift the pulpit back in place. A cranky infant, up late, howled. When I opened the hundred-year-old Bible to Luke's account of the Epiphany, black dust from the binding rubbed off on my hands and on the altar cloth. In this church pageant, is the birth of Jesus simply being acted out, uh, staged, or is something else happening? Well, it's as if the girl who's playing Mary is actually feeling the same thing that Mary felt. Hmm. Why did this happen mm -hmm. to me, that I was chosen? What does this mean about me? So the story, in a sense, is, is replaying itself. Mm -hmm. What about the old Bible, the hundred-year-old Bible, that you turned to and opened to Luke's account of the Epiphany? And then there's this black dust mm. that comes off it, yeah, gets on your hand. It's literally a, a detail of the, of the physical disintegration of the binding of the book. And it gets on you, the dust. Yes. Ashes. It's ashes. Dust and ashes. It's all there, our beginning and our end. Depression. A moat, a little world, dusty, dusty. The universe is dust. Who can bear it? Christ comes. The women feed him, bathe his feet with tears, bring spices, find the empty tomb, burst out to tell the men are not believed. The dust mode makes you think of a little world, that um, the world is dust, that the universe is only dust. The thought that each dust mode is a discrete world, mm -hmm. say, with people living on it who are suffering. Dust suggests that, um, that such suffering is, is without meaning. The nature yeah. of dust, yeah. dry, it's dead, it's, it's dead. Yeah. It's bereft of any spirit. Mm. Well, then in this poem, the women bring tears. They bring water. Ah. It's the women who make life happen. And this is discredited by disbelieving men. Simon Peter hears Mary Magdalene tell him that Christ is not in the tomb. He's not there. He's mm -hmm. risen. And he doesn't say this in the Gospels, but he, he clearly thinks to himself, this can't be true. This, what this woman is telling me cannot be true. Because she's a woman. Because she's a woman. Now that's a subject for depression. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble with math in a one-room country school the others bent their heads and started in. Confused, I asked my neighbor to explain, a sturdy, bright-cheeked girl who brought raw milk to school from her family's herd of Holsteins. Anne had a blue bookmark, and on it Christ revealed his beating heart, holding the flesh back with his wounded hand. Anne understood division. Miss Moran sprang from her monumental desk and led me roughly through the class without a word. My shame was radical as she propelled me past the cloakroom to the furnace closet where only the boys were put, only the older ones at that. The door swung briskly shut. The warmth, the gloom, the smell of sweeping compound clinging to the broom soothed me. I found a bucket, turned it upside down, and sat, hugging my knees. I hummed a theme from Haydn that I knew from my piano lessons, and hardened my heart against authority. And then I heard her steps, 
her fingers on the latch. She led me, blinking and changed, back to the class. You're placed in this furnace closet where only the older boys are put when they misbehave. This is the maximum security prison. Huh. I mean, this is, this is the big time. <laughs> what got you in the closet in the first place was the fact that you spoke up in class, that is, asking your neighbor, Anne, for help in math. Mm -hmm. um, well, I suppose the teacher regarded it as cheating. Yeah. So there was her version mm -hmm. of reality, I was cheating, and my version of reality, which was, I need help. Well, Anne understood division. <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. That's right. Well, being locked in the closet, of course, says you're, you're bad. You're a bad person. Mm. And um, I'm thinking to myself, no, I'm not a bad person. I'm a person who got locked in the closet, yeah. but I'm, a, I'm not a bad person. Which is itself a kind of division that is being divided yes. from the rest and yes. being locked in the yes. closet. Yes, well, it's the discovery, I guess, in this final stanza that I have my own version of reality, which I must honor. Mm -hmm. A boy goes into the world. My brother rode off on his bike into the summer afternoon, but mother called me back from the end of the drive. It's different for girls. How that stung. He'd be gone for hours, come back with things, a cocoon, gray-brown and papery around a stick, a puffball, ripe, wrinkled, and exuding spores, owl pellets, bits of undigested bone and fur, and pieces of moss that might have made toupees for preposterous green men, but went instead into a wide-necked jar for a terrarium. He mounted his plunder on poster board, gluing and naming each piece. He has long since forgotten those days and things, but I, at last, can claim them as my own. Your brother was uh, permitted to go out and hunt, so to speak. Whereas you were not. It's different for girls, your mother says. Women are not free to move about in this world. We are not free. And the child in this poem is really chafing at that. She's on a leash, in a way. Uh, your mother is at the end of the drive. That's isn't? right. That's as far as you go, kid. Not only are you not free to go off for a block of time, which is unaccounted for, you are not free to have an interest in the natural world. Mm -hmm. You're not free. That's for boys, this business of being scientific. This is not for girls. Your brother has forgotten his adventures, uh, the, uh, the booty that he uh, claimed in the natural world. But you claim them as your own. As an artist, I claim yeah. them. As, an, as a poet, I claim them. By bringing them back in poetry. Mm. I resurrect them and claim them as my mm -hmm. own. Catching Frogs. I crouched beside the deepest pool, and the smell of damp and moss rose rich between my knees. Water striders creased the silver-black silky surface. Wrapped, I hardly breathed. Gnats roiled in a shaft of sun. Back again after supper, I'd see a nose poke up by the big flat stone at the lip of the fall. Then the humped eyes and the slippery emerald head, freckled brown. The buff membrane pulsed under the jaw while subtleties of timing played in my mind. With the patience that came like grace, I waited. Mosquitoes moaned all around. Better to wait. Better to reach from behind. It grew dark. I came into the warm, bright room where Father held aloft the evening paper, and there was talk and maybe laughter. 
though I don't remember laughter. You certainly capture the frog in the poem, but you don't make your strike. No. Is that, uh, is that significant in the poem? I think it is somehow. I don't quite know how myself. Um, I just don't get my right moment, so I wait. I hold off. Then it gets dark and it's time to come in. Yeah. And there you return to the other world, mm -hmm. the family world, the adult world. The outer world. Yeah, and a much more structured world in many yeah, ways. The outer world, yeah. as opposed to the inward and your father holds aloft the evening newspaper. Mm -hmm. This is the real world I'm yeah. coming back into. That's what society tells us anyway. That yeah. This is the real world, as opposed to yeah. the inward world, right. which of course I don't right. subscribe to at all. Yeah. What's the really interesting reality, after all? It's Not the, the news. No, it's the inwardness of things. That's where the news is. Insomnia. The almost disturbing scent of peonies presses through the screens, and I know without looking how those heavy white heads lean down under the moon's light. A cricket chafes and pauses, chafes and pauses, as if distracted or preoccupied. When I open my eyes to document my sleeplessness by the clock, a point of greenish light pulses near the ceiling, a firefly. In childhood, I ran out at dusk, a jar in one hand, lid pierced with air holes in the other, getting soaked to the knees in the long, wet grass. The light moves unsteadily, like someone whose balance is uncertain after traveling many hours, coming a long way. Get up, get up, and let it out. But I leave it hovering overhead, in case it's my father come back from the dead to ask, why are you still awake? You can put grass in their jar in the morning. You play with the idea that the firefly could have been your father's soul, then? Perhaps that, yeah. that a soul would come back in the form of an animal. It comes at a time of, of tension, trouble, insomnia, mm -hmm. late at night. It comes as a gift. And from a long distance away. In space and time. Yeah. It's almost like a, um, a small person holding a lantern. Yes, or it's a little like the bat in that earlier mm -hmm. poem. Yeah. This emanation from the natural mm -hmm. world. Something that comes quite unexpectedly? Yes, unasked for, unlooked for. And gives you ease? That's right. It triggers the, the memories of childhood and um, the memory of going, of catching out, of going out with yeah. a jar. Yeah. Then sleep comes sort of at the end of the poem uh, with, with the confusion of persons. Is the firefly my father or... Who is speaking mm. to me? Who, who is saying, Why are you still awake? Why are you still awake? High water. Eight days of rain. The ground refuses more. My neighbors are morose at the village store. I'm sick of holding still, sick of indoors, so I walk through the heavy headed grasses to watch the river reach for the bridge's wooden planks, bending the lithe swamp maples that grow along the banks. Nothing but trouble comes to mind as I lean over the rusty iron rail. I know of plenty in detail that is not my own. I nudge a pebble over the edge. It drops with a thunk into the water, dark, voluminous and clear, and moving headlong away from here. Nothing except trouble comes to mind, but not just your own, the poem says. Well, one thing about living in the country is that you, you feel a connectedness with your neighbors. You feel a sense of community 
uh, that I certainly never felt when I was living in Ann Arbor, where we lived before we moved here. One does know one's neighbor's business. And uh, sometimes that's unhappy business. Standing on the bridge, looking down into the river, you nudge a pebble over the edge. It is partly a gesture of idleness. Well, how far will the current take it if I nudge it? How far mm -hmm. will it go? How far away from here will it get? Um, and that, of course, is the motion of the soul in this poem. Mm -hmm. Get me out of here. You've had it for a while. Yeah. Too much trouble. Yeah, get me out of here. And the, the thing about poetry, the magical thing about poetry, is that you can talk about one thing in terms of another. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, it's a pebble. In this case, it's a pebble. Kicking a pebble off the edge of a bridge. At the Public Market Museum, Charleston, South Carolina. A volunteer, a daughter of the Confederacy, receives my admission and points the way. Here are gray jackets with holes in them, red sashes with individual flourishes, things soft as flesh. Someone sewed the red silk cord onto that gray sleeve as if embellishments could keep a man alive. I have been reading War and Peace, and so the particulars of combat are on my mind the shouts and groans of men and boys, and the horses' cries as they fall, astonished at what has happened to them. Blood on leaves, blood on grass, on snow, extravagant beauty of red, smoke, dust of disturbed earth, parch and burn. Who would choose this for himself? and yet the terrible machinery waited in place. With salters in their breast pockets and gloves knitted by their sisters and sweethearts, the men in gray hurled themselves out of the trenches and rushed against blue. It was what both sides agreed to do. The poem sees a kind of tacit agreement between enemies that this is what we do. And it's clearly ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> if we decided we wouldn't have any more wars, why, we just wouldn't have any more wars. If we made that choice. Yeah. You know, to dismantle the terrible machinery yeah. that we waits in place. We forget that this is, a, this is an option. This is actually an option. It's a very real option to us. The terrible machinery is concrete weaponry, it's military mm -hmm. budgets. Yes, it is. But it is also a set attitude. I suppose. Uh, that waits in place. I suppose. Um, and out of which we move. Yeah. And we've been doing this for centuries. Yeah. Following a certain sequence of actions. As, as though they were... When prompted to do so. Yeah. As though they yeah. were ineluctable. When yeah. in fact, with some self-examination and some rethinking, uh, these things would not inevitably be true. Yeah. The noise of the battle, as it replays itself in your mind and in the poem, stands in direct contrast to the hush, the silence of the museum itself, which is filled with shh sounds that are coming from the things you're looking at, like red sashes, individual flourishes, embellishments, soft as flesh. Uh, were you thinking of that when you, when you wrote this poem, or did something just happen? Well, the muse must have been nearby that day. <laughs> the I... muse is smarter than I am. <laughs> Much. Back from the city. After three days and nights of rich food and late talk in overheated rooms, of walks between mounds of garbage and human forms bedded down for the night under rags, I come back to my dooryard, to my own wooden step. 
The last red leaves fall to the ground, and frost has blackened the herbs and asters that grew beside the porch. The air is still and cool, and the withered grass lies flat in the field. A nuthatch spirals down the rough trunk of the tree. At the cloisters, I indulged in piety while gazing at a painted lindenwood pieta. Mary holding her pierced and desiccated son across her knees. But when a man stepped close under the tasseled awning of the hotel, asking for a quarter for someone down on his luck, I quickly turned my back. Now I hear tiny bits of bark and moss break off under the bird's beak and claw and fall onto already fallen leaves. Do you love me? said Christ to his disciple. Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. What do they mean, those words, for you in the context of the poem? The it event? means to me, it means you are your brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. This is your problem. And you cannot turn your back on it. Which the speaker of the poem does. That's for right. A tries there. to. Tries to. Of course, in a city like New York, it's very difficult. I mean, you cannot feed every person who comes to you. In the country, here where we live, it's a little easier for us. I mean, we have, for instance, food banks, and one can give to these things and feel uh, a mild flush of relief um, from guilt. But what we really need to address is the injustices of a society in which there are many people who are dispossessed, unemployed. Yeah. The kind of contrast that are there in the opening of the poem, where you walk between mounds of garbage and human forms, bedded yeah. down for the night. Our refuse, our refuse, our trash, the people we consider to be expendable. Hmm. Coming home at twilight in late summer, we turned into the drive and gravel flew up from the tires like sparks from a fire. So much to be done the unpacking, the mail and papers, the grass needed mowing. We climbed stiffly out of the car. The shut-off engine ticked as it cooled. And then we noticed the pear tree, the limbs so heavy with fruit they nearly touched the ground. We went out to the meadow. Our steps made black holes in the grass and we each took a pair and ate and were grateful. Poet Jane Kenyon, reading from Let Evening Come, published by Grey Wolf Press. I'm Henry Lyman. Thanks for joining us. Poems to a Listener was produced by Henry Lyman in cooperation with WFCR Amherst, Massachusetts. This program was supported by the Witter Binner Foundation for Poetry and the National Endowment for the Arts.